You'll get a chance to look over these new models in just a few minutes, fellas, but uh, first let me tell you what I learned about them at the training center. I'm sure it'll help you understand the new features better. Uh, let me in on it too, Bill. Maybe I can be of help. Glad to have you, Tech. There's so much to cover, I might easily overlook some of the features. Starting with the new body, you can see it looks different. The big story, though, is its design and construction. That's entirely new. I've got pictures that'll show some of the details. Here's the floor panel. Notice that it's ribbed in a number of places for added strength and is welded into one solid piece. On the underside are two heavy gauge steel box section side rails. They are welded to the floor panel and extend from about the forward edge of the rear seat to the rear of the floor panel. The rails are particularly rugged where they extend over the rear axle kick up. These rails are the main support of the rear suspension and rear bumper. The body panels are bolted to the floor panel, huh? Not bolted, Ed. Welded. They're welded to the floor panel and to each other. The entire body structure actually has more wells than we've ever used. It gives us the strongest body construction we've ever had. Here's something else. There's a heavy U-channel crossmember welded to the underside of the floor panel at a point just above the transmission. This crossmember forms the mounting for the... Excuse me for cutting in, Bill, but aren't you going to talk about the rust-proofing treatment this new body gets? Oh, yes, Tech, I nearly forgot that. Uh, you see, fellas, the body metal is treated with rust-proofing chemicals to provide greater protection against corrosion. The lower 18 inches of the body is actually dipped and washed in a series of baths with chemicals and rust-proofing compounds. This carries protection internally and externally to all areas where a normal spray might not reach. Oh, what's so special about that? All bodies are supposed to be rust-proofed, aren't they? Sure, but the special part is that Chrysler has developed new chemicals and techniques that make this treatment an outstanding method of preserving metal. Oh, I get it. Now, what did you start to say about that U-channel, Bill? Well, I started to say that the U-channel forms the mounting for the rear crossmember of the frame subassembly. The subassembly extends forward, starting at approximately the front edge of the front seat. It's bolted to the body and floor panel by 10 aircraft type bolts. The subassembly carries the weight of the engine, transmission, and front suspension parts. So we've got a floor panel and body panels all welded together and a subassembly bolted to the final assembly. Looks to me like it's a stronger setup than when we had a separate frame with a body bolted to it. Sure is, Jack. There are other body construction features you're going to like, even though you can't see some of them. For example, panel joints are so overlapped, they shed water like shingles. The windshield and rear window areas have been given special attention. There's a new weather strip that grips the glass better, and a new sealer instead of cement to give a weather-tight job. The windshield pillar doesn't have that dog leg it used to have, and it looks stronger, too. That's right, Jack. And the moldings are held on with clips instead of screws. Notice these new door hinges, too. A cam and spring arrangement holds the door in two positions. It has two built-in stops, or detents, so the door check strap is no longer necessary. Good point, Tech. The hinges are still adjustable, though, in case you have to change a door alignment. Is the uh, door latch new, Bill? Yes, it is, Jack. It's quieter in operation, and there's a stronger simplified linkage between the latch mechanism and the door handle. The linkage is adjustable to take up the slack. There's a freewheeling arrangement in the latch that disconnects the handle when the door is locked. That means you can't break the handle by trying to open the door when it's locked. Well, that's a good feature. I like that. You'll like the new power-operated door locks. There's an electrical system standard on the Imperial and a new vacuum system that's optional on all other models. You'll find the whole story in the reference book. Anything new on front seat adjustment? Yes. The seat tracks have six mounting positions. You can select the one which best suits the driver. You still get the back and forth adjustment regardless of the position selected. What about the swivel seats? Well, they automatically swing out when the door is opened and return to latched position when the door is closed. Hey, that's all right. How's it work? Well, it has a cable, spring, and torsion bar arrangement. Here's a drawing showing the hookup. You can study it later. 
Now, uh, that's about all I wanted to cover on the body. Let's talk about engines. Yeah, man, that's what I'm interested in. Understand we got a brand new six. We sure have, fella. And what a six, as Bill can tell you. Yeah, Ed, this is one engine we're going to be proud of. It's an overhead valve job and is mounted at an angle of 30 degrees to the right from vertical. That provides a lower center of gravity, a lower hood line, and allows room for the new manifolding system. If you're interested in specifications, Ed, its displacement is 225 cubic inches. Bore is 3.4, and stroke is 4 and 1 8. Compression ratio is 8 and 1 half to 1, and the engine delivers its outstanding performance on regular fuel. Hmm, oil filter, distributor, oil pump, fuel pump, and coil. All on the right side where you can reach them, that's good. Hey, look at these spark plug cables, Ed. I noticed them, Jack. They seal the spark plug openings like a rubber plug. And the plug is set in a tube which acts as a gasket and also protects the plug. That's certainly a good feature. You'll notice the engine uses a single barrel carburetor. And this new intake manifold is made of aluminum. Has a separate passage for each cylinder. That's one thing that contributes to the fuel economy and performance of this engine. How about the other engines, Bill? Have there been any changes? No basic changes, Jack, but there have been a number of refinements that will improve performance. For example, on V8 engines, there's a new paper element fuel filter in the line between the fuel pump and the carburetor. It is a throwaway type and should be replaced as required. The V8 engine front mounts are new, but retain the shear type construction. It's a very sturdy mount, has more rubber than formerly, and will contribute to smoothness. The rear mount is entirely new and is a combination of a rubber block and a coil spring. The spring allows a little more movement at the rear, which damps out driveline vibrations, and the rubber block absorbs high frequency noises. You fellows in the lubrication department are going to like the phosphate-coated oil level dipstick. Makes it a lot easier to read oil level. That's right, Tech. How about a rundown on the various eight-cylinder engines used? Well, I can give you that picture once over lightly. For example... Uh, wait a minute, Bill. Better make clear that your information applies to cars built in the United States. Canadian-built cars have different specifications. Good point, Tech. They are different. There's a table of Canadian engine specifications in the reference book, so I'll just cover United States-built engines. The six-cylinder engine we've mentioned will be used whenever a six is specified. That includes the Plymouth and Dodge Dart lines. Before you go any farther, Bill, you'd better flip the platter. We're running out of grooves. In the V8 group, we start with a three 18-cubic-inch job with mechanical taffets. That's found on some Plymouth Fury and Suburban models as standard equipment and is available for the Dodge Dart V8 line. The same engine is available with Super Pack as optional equipment on some Plymouth models. That's with a four-barrel carburetor and a dual exhaust system, but still with a nine-to-one compression ratio, so it will perform on standard fuel. That same engine, when used as standard equipment on the Dodge Dart Phoenix model, uses a four-barrel carburetor, doesn't it? That's right, Tech. How about that uh, 361 cubic inch engine? Is that still used? Oh, yes. You'll find it as standard equipment on the Dodge Matador and the DeSoto Fireflight models. And it's available as an option in place of the 318 engine in many cases. The 383 cubic inch engine is standard on Dodge Polara models and optional on the Dodge Matador. It uses a new Holley four-barrel carburetor, which we will get into some other time. This engine, known as the D500, is fitted with ram induction when used for optional equipment on the Phoenix, Matador, or Polara models. Uh, that ought to make a nice power plant. You ain't heard nothing yet, fella. Hang on. That's right, Ed. Our engine equipment this year ought to satisfy just about everyone. Now, we mentioned a moment ago that the DeSoto Fireflight models use the 361 cubic inch engine with a two-barrel carburetor. It has a 10 to 1 compression ratio, hydraulic tappets, and uses premium fuel. The DeSoto Adventurer line uses the 383 cubic inch engine with a two-barrel carburetor. The engine is available with a four-barrel carburetor as optional equipment on all Fireflight and Adventurer models. 
You can get this engine with ram induction as optional only on the Adventurer model. They call it the ram charge engine. That's right, Tech. Chrysler has a nice engine lineup, too. The Golden Lion, 383 cubic inch with a two-barrel carburetor, is standard on Windsor and with a four-barrel carburetor on Saratoga models. The Golden Lion 413 cubic inch engine with a four-barrel carburetor is standard on the New Yorker models and on Imperial models. Well, we certainly have an assortment of engines that is second to none in the industry. You're right, Jack. I can't wait to try that new six. I'll bet that's a honey. You'll be more enthusiastic after you've had it out on the road, too, Ed. I promise you. Uh, better get along with the other features, Bill. Takes more than an engine to make a good car. I'll keep your shirt on now, Tech. We'll get to them before we're through. But uh, before I forget it, I want to caution you about raising these new models on the type of hoist that contacts the car body rather than the front and rear suspension parts. Say, that's right. We lost our frame, didn't we? Yes, the hoist pads must make contact in the right spots or they may damage the body. The diagram in this reference book makes that clear. Okay, Bill, we'll watch it. Well, fine. Now, all mufflers and tailpipes on the new models are aluminized. That'll make them last about twice as long as formerly. Good, and that's something we've needed for some time. I agree. And the exhaust pipes are now routed through the propeller shaft tunnel in the floor panel. It protects the system from road damage. On some models, you'll find a ball joint exhaust pipe connection just ahead of the muffler. That lets you line up the exhaust system so it won't interfere with other parts of the car. You'll find new exhaust line hangers on all models. Now we can do a good job of keeping exhaust system vibrations from being annoying. That'll be a big help, all right. What about the front end, Bill? Anything new there? Well, torsion bar anchors are positioned differently, Jack. They are inverted from their former position and located inside the subassembly rear cross member where they get better protection from road splash. Front end specifications are also different. So be sure to check them in the reference book when you get a front-end job. Uh, better mention that tip on turning the torsion bar anchor bolt when adjusting front-end height, Bill. Oh, yeah, Tech. Good point. Use a torque wrench to adjust the torsion bar. If it takes more than 200 foot-pounds to turn the bolt, let the front wheel hang down to relieve the load on the torsion bar. Then replace the anchor bolt and swivel. Thanks, Bill. I'll keep it in mind. Hey, this new body construction makes the rear suspension different, doesn't it? Yes, but it's not entirely due to the body. Those rear springs are new. Notice that the main leaves are constant section design instead of being grooved as before. This change increases spring life. Yeah, and the forward spring eye is different. That's right. It has a two-inch diameter rubber bushing that helps absorb wheel and driveline vibrations and takes up the shock of driving and braking force. Here's another feature. Mounting brackets are now attached by bolts to the unit body. That makes them easier to service than riveted brackets. And how about that spring replacement tip, Bill? Right. If you have to replace a rear spring, remove the brackets from the body. You'll need this special tool to remove the larger bushing in the front eye. As far as the brakes are concerned, they're the same effective three-platform total contact brakes that went into production on late 59 models. But the parking brake is different. Actually, there are two types of parking brakes used, depending on which type of transmission is in the car. Cars with a manual transmission use the six inch external band type of brake. Automatic transmission jobs use the seven inch internal two shoe brake. Adjusting specifications are the same as formerly. But since the parking brake operating mechanism is new, You'll need some adjusting information on it. I noticed that there's a step-on pedal up here instead of the brake cable handle we had last year. That's right. There's a step-on pedal and a release lever. The cable is attached to the pedal and to the operating lever at the brake band or shoes. Band and shoe adjustments are the same as they have been, so we won't go into that. However, the cable may stretch after it's been in service for a while, and you may have to adjust it. Now, here's the procedure. Just pull on the threaded end of the cable to take out the slack, then tighten the adjusting nut until it is seated on the trunnion and holds the slack out of the cable. That's all there is to it. It sounds so simple, I know I can do it. <laughs> I guess you can, Ed. 
Now, do you know about the new clutch used with manual transmission jobs? No, Tech, that's news to me. What's the story? Well, there's a new semi-centrifugal clutch available, Ed. That's the big story. This clutch permits easier pedal action, but still provides a tight grip against the clutch disc. Here's how it works. The clutch pressure plate springs are slightly softer, but there are six small cylindrical flyweights between the pressure plate and the cover, which move outward by centrifugal force. They add a wedging action to the pressure plate, which increases the torque transmitting ability of the clutch. Besides the new clutch, there are a number of other features. Uh, hold it, Bill. There's a lot more to talk about, but you're almost out of talking room. How about giving us some final highlights? Okay, Tech. I just wanted to mention that there are three manual transmissions. First, there's a new transmission used only with a new six-cylinder engine. Second, there's the manual transmission we've been using. It goes with the V8 engines. Third, there's a new heavy-duty three-speed manual transmission that's optional for the larger V8 engines. Besides the manual transmissions, there's a new Torque Flight 6 three-speed automatic transmission. It's optional equipment on Plymouth and Dodge models equipped with the new six-cylinder engine. It's a compact, lighter weight version of the regular torque flight transmission that has proved so successful. The converter housing and transmission case are made in one piece of die-cast aluminum. It has a lot of new features you fellas will like. While service procedures are easy, they're quite different. So we'll go into that in more detail at some later date. Uh, one more thing, Tech. Chrysler and Imperial cars feature panelescent lighting of their instrument panels. Now, that's something entirely new. It sure is. And it calls for a new testing technique to learn. Right you are, Tech. There are so many things so new, we'll have to study them further one at a time. Meanwhile, keep this reference book handy. It helps fill some of the gaps. Don't worry, Bill. This book and I are going steady as of now. Same goes for me. And don't let me miss the next meeting. Not a chance, Jack. Good service goes far in helping new cars win acceptance. We'll meet again before you know it. In the meantime, keep up the good work. Thank you.